here with another episode of the Star Wars Podcast. And today's episode is about Troy Denning's book, The Unseen Queen, which is the second book in the Dark Nest Trilogy. So, the events in this book occur approximately in 36 ABY, which is about one year after the previous book, The Joiner King. So, that will have happened 35 ABY. These are events later. You know, Kilks have established colonies on planets in the nebula and or get away from the chess and whatnot. And so, things are going up. Now, my thoughts on this book is I enjoyed this a lot more than The Joiner King. It had more of that cliffhanger you keep on wanting to read effect to it. Though, it's not the best Star Wars book I've ever read. I still rather enjoyed it, especially as I got more and more to the ending. Unlike the last book, it was just kind of like, I dredged through it, I kind of enjoyed it, didn't really like it. This one was definitely a lot more enjoyable the further you got along in it. Um, Troy Denning, in the last book, I was saying that Troy Denning kept on doing this effect more and more near the end that he didn't do at the beginning of the book, where he switched character perspectives a lot, which is something I'm not, I'm fine with, but the thing was he would do it when he wasn't doing it a lot before, so you weren't really used to it in that style of writing for that book per se, and he didn't necessarily do the same thing in this book. Most of the chapters were just one character in their perspective. There were a couple chapters where he did change the character perspective in the middle. I don't get why he did that instead of splitting into um, just one chapter. I think I mean, into separate chapters. I think he could have just separated the chapters out even though it may have been a short three page chapter. I'm more fine with that than um just switching the character perspective in the middle of the chapter when you're not used to the writer doing it much in the book unless it is absolutely necessary for that chapter. I don't necessarily think it was absolutely necessary for any of the chapters we were in because I think they were kind of from what I remember, they're a little bit more dramatic changes, like scene changes and whatnot. Now, a time change for one of those little skips is a little different to me. That's something you can do whether or not you've been doing it throughout the book. As long as it's going on in the storyline, maybe just had to skip like five minutes because there wasn't much that happened that five minutes. Okay, now let's get... Down to the plot. This is where I'm going to be putting spoilers out there for anyone who's listening. And just as a reminder, this book is now in the Legends. It's not actually considered canon. So anyways, the basic plot is this is a year after the Joiner King's events. And the Helix are now blaming the Jedi. And I guess in a way the Galactic Alliance... For this fizz that has appeared on the planet that has been deteriorating, I guess, Killicks and killing off several Killicks because, you know, the Jedi basically gave them these plants and they're saying, you knew this was here and it would harm us. And um, so Luke, Leia, Mara, Han, and Saba all go to. Wotebe, which I guess is the main planet in the system, to talk to Raynar or Unuthol about what's going on, and that's not actually their fault in order to prove to them that they aren't as bad as he's saying they are. So in the end, I... Okay, um... So, what happens is they make a deal for Luke and Han to stay on the planet to, I guess, investigate the Fizz in the darkness while Leia and them take a sample of the Fizz to the Jedi Order to sample with Seagull. And so, they go there and Han and Luke stay and they end up finding that 
Fizz doesn't exactly attack everything. It more attacks just unnatural stuff that seem to be attacking the planet itself. Meanwhile, Leia and Saba and whatnot find out that the Fizz basically is trying to keep the planet in its normal conditions and anything that harms the normal conditions is going to be killed off. And it happened to stay there after the nebula was formed by a supernova because it wasn't completely destroyed and some seeds of grass and whatnot stayed there and whatever was living on the planet did not. And that's why no one's returned. So anyways, eventually the Galactic Alliance is like being pushed by the Chish, Chiss and because the Chiss are thinking they're on the side of the Kilix, so Galactic Alliance sends a blockade out. Meanwhile, Kalamas is trying to Kalamas, the chief of state, is trying to force the Jedi to accept a leader that's kind of bad for the Jedi Order since Luke is away because he feels he doesn't agree with what the Jedi Orders necessarily are doing. So, Jedi Order split. Leia goes out with a group to um, Roteba and is stopped by the blockade. Leia and Saba are captured while the others are staying in stasis. Meanwhile, Han and Luke escape with June and Tarfang who appear because they're doing some business deals. And um, they end up finding out what's going on and that fleet's going to be attacked and they try to help the fleet but it's too late and the Kilks have launched an attack on the fleet in order to get out of the system. So, the end of the battle is kind of where the book leaves off with the basis that there's a war going on. The Chiss think that the Galactic Alliance is on the side of the Kilix. Meanwhile, the Galactic Alliance is against the Kilix. So, it's kind of like a three-wayer. Like, Chiss is attacking the Kilix, or going to attack the Kilix. They're about to make preemptive strike. And the Galactic Alliance is kind of already at war with the Kilix. And the Kilix are at war with both the Chiss and the um, Galactic Alliance. So, but it's kind of like a three-way war. There's three sides. It's not a two-side war like most. So, it makes it kind of interesting, you know? And so that's where the book ends up. Now let's put some background. I already named the background, sorry. Uh, so a subplot in this book is dealing with Jason, who now has a daughter that was born to the queen of the Hoppins Empire, and he plans to protect her. There's a threat. He goes after that threat towards her that was put by Killix, who had been hired to try to attack them. Which was actually um, the grandmother. He basically kind of incapacitates her, and he's had this vision of a never ending war, so he tries to prevent that by harming part of the Chiss fleet, which kind of makes the Chiss even more against the Galactic Alliance because, you know, the Jedi affiliated with them. So that's basically one of the subplots. That are leading into this three plot war. I mean three sided war not three plot war. But uh, I enjoyed the story. As I said it was very much more interesting. I think when the story really got going. Was whenever Tarfang and June show up with Han, Han Solo and them. I, I didn't really like. I didn't really enjoy the book as much until that point because of Raynar Thol or Unu Thol's stubbornness. I'm sorry, but I think Troy Denning goes way too far with that because it just has annoyed the heck out of me because I don't know how anyone could necessarily be that stubborn not to look at the facts and realize that they're there. Oh, then again, I guess it's a reflection of society itself because society does that sometimes as well. But I think 
if you've read the first book in the trilogy, I would necessarily say this is a should read because it was a lot better than the first book. It might, if you didn't enjoy the first book, it might redeem it a little bit. And um, if you just are looking for a Star Wars book to read, I don't think this one is necessarily a bad one to read. But there are definitely higher ones on the list to read if you're looking for one to buy with your money. But I've enjoyed it. So keep it on the back burner. If you were ever just bored and need to find something to read, this would probably make a good read. Especially for a Star Wars fan. So, this is Indiana signing out. See you later.